Hello all and welcome to another edition of Everyday Black History, where we highlight the historical achievements and contributions of black men and women and institutions both past and present. Now today we're going to be highlighting an institution, an institution by the name of Wilberforce University. Now, Wilberforce University is a private co-ed liberal arts HBCU in Ohio, and it's the first uh, HBCU that's owned and operated by African Americans. The founding of the college was a collaboration between two churches, the Methodist Episcopal Church and the AME um, Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and they opened up this college um, with a way to provide classical education and teacher training for black youth. Now, this college att attracted uh, top professors of the day, such as uh, W.E.B. Du Bois being one of them, and um, it also uh, supported other organizations, such as the uh, National Association of African American Museums, to broaden the reach of its programs and to assist, assist smaller museums with professional uh, standards. Now, Wilberforce University was opened in 1856, and its first president was elected in 1858, and his, he was Reverend Richard S. Rust. By 1860, the university had more than 200 students, most of which were, were from the South, rather than from Ohio or from the Northern states. Now, uh, these students were the natural mixed-race sons and daughters of the wealthy white planters and their African-American mistresses. Uh, their fathers paid for the education that would have been denied them, their children in the South. And these were the men who did not abandon their mixed race children, but provided them with uh, the social capital of education and even, and even sometimes property. But now there were a few events during the 1860s that almost threatened the existence of Wilberforce University, um, one of which being the uh, Civil War. Many of the planters and farmers who supported the college uh, withdrew their money to help support the war, and they even uh, withdrew their children as well, so there weren't, were, weren't as many paying students in the school. So the school almost closed because it couldn't be funded. But even after they got the funding, an arson fire in 1865 um, nearly closed it again. But through the help of some abolitionists and even a chief justice, Money was brought together in which the college was again rebuilt so that it can continue the education of black men and women. Now, as mentioned, uh, generations of leaders, teachers, ministers, doctors, politicians, and college administrators were either um, teaching at the school or they attended the school for education. Um, one of which we mentioned was uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, as well as others, um, such as Edward Clark, and even uh, Lieutenant Charles Young, who was the third black graduate of West Point, and was the, um, at that time, the highest ranking African American who was a commissioned officer in the U.S. Army. He, had the, he headed the military science department. By the way, we'll be having an, an episode, an Everyday Black History episode, on um, Charles Young as well, and talk about his accomplishments. Uh, some other scholars who taught at Wilberforce University was Theophilus uh, Stewart, who was a politician, a theologian, and a missionary, as well as uh, Richard R. Wright, Jr., who was the first African-American to earn a Ph.D. from the University of Pennsylvania. These men were also uh, prominent in the American Negro Academy, which was founded in 1897 to support the work of scholars, writers, and other intellectuals. The uh, organization was rebranded the Black Academy of Arts and Letters in 1969. Now in the 1900s, uh, Wilberforce continued to grow so much to the point where in the, 40, uh, the 50s, uh, off it was able to um, have an offshoot of itself, um, which became Central State University, another HBCU which furthered the education of uh, black men and women uh, during that time as well. And in the 1970s, Wilberforce University established the National Afro-American Museum and Cultural Center, which provided uh, exhibits and outreach to the region, and that is now operated uh, by the Ohio Historical Society. So as we can see, you know, from this institution, this, this HBCU, that it contributed greatly 
to uh, African American culture and African American history. And um, as I say, you know, it's good to you know do your own research and look up some of these institutions and some of these people up. As you know, you know, it's, it, you can educate yourself on them as well. And it's also you know refreshing uh, finding out. Uh, what these institutions and what these people accomplished and how it contributed to black culture and black history. So do yourself a favor and look it up whenever you get a chance. But that concludes this episode of Everyday Black History. Um, We'll be coming at you soon with more institutions and more people that we'll be highlighting. So stay tuned.